Shall we begin, Father Tony? All right. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jason Benitez. I'm the Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion with the Capital Region Chamber. Uh, Ellis Medicine is a Capital Region Chamber member. We are a member-driven organization, about 2,600 member businesses in our area, employing about 150,000 folks. Uh, your, your CEO, Paul Milton, has been our Chamber Board Chair in the past, so uh, we're happy to be uh, collaborative partners. Uh, not only in, in the ongoing work, but with some of this, this training as, uh, as well. Um, those of you, uh, you might have seen me in the past two years or so here. I've been doing uh, a few training right. sessions. Um, as you continue uh, on your own organizational journey here uh, with DEI at Ellis, and as I understand um, with Ellis Promise, uh, it's a great opportunity for the local youth, uh, particularly the local youth in Schenectady, uh, and I know that it's also going to mean possibly a coming together of, of supervisor-supervisee relationships that may not have existed in the past. Um, so we're, we're here to just take a little bit of a deeper dive into the term microaggressions, what they are, who experiences them, what we can do about them. Uh, we, we did a, a one-hour one one workshop on bias, I believe, a little over a year ago, and some of you may have locked into some smaller fireside chats with Paul Milton, those were virtual calls uh, around the topic where we just scratched the surface on microaggression. So we're gonna go into it a little bit more uh, because when the workplace is not inclusive and when folks uh, who are, 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 are charged with uh, being leaders in that workforce are, are not as culturally competent as we would like, uh, the opportunity for microaggressions is definitely right. And we want to try to avoid that because microaggressions happening in the workplace uh, detracts from the inclusive environment that we're trying to promote and, and create. So um, we'll, we'll get into it today. I, I'm realizing with this talk that this is more two hours of content, but we'll try to cram it into 90 minutes. So if there are times where it seems like I'm moving a little fast, please, if there's something that you want to ask or, or, or comment on, don't hesitate to raise your hand. Um, and I would have liked to do this opening kind of I call it a icebreaker, but just more just to get the, the conversation going. Again, if we had two hours, I would probably have you stand or, or find someone in chat, but we're going to, um, uh, we're just going to do it as a large group today, if that's okay, uh, just to kind of, uh, um, you know, devote a little less time to this, this beginning part. But um, <clears throat> I'd like for everyone in this room to just think about a time where you felt diminished or silenced at work, diminished or silenced at work. How did that make you feel and was anything done to address it? Uh, or if you're really scratching your noodle to come up with one of those, uh, you can also think about a time that you were supported or affirmed at work. And uh, conversely, what impact did that have on your work experience? So uh, take, a, take 30 seconds to brainstorm, but I'd love to open up the conversation today as a large group with a time you were either diminished or silenced at work, and how did that make you feel? Was anything done about it? or a time that you were supported or affirmed, and uh, also what impact did that have on your work experience? And I have um, an example or two to get us started if there's really uh, you know, nothing in the audience. But. Diminished or silenced or affirmed and supported? <coughs> I can give one. Um, for those who might know, I, I came from a higher ed background. Most recently, I'll be with the chamber five years next July, but most recently I was just down the road at Union College for eight years as Associate Dean of DEI. Um, <clears throat> and I remember my position was unique in that I reported to the Chief Diversity Officer, who was part of the President's Cabinet, but the work that I did operated mostly in student affairs, <coughs> which had its other own VP, and at times my supervisor, our Chief Diversity Officer, the VP of Student Affairs, didn't always see eye to eye on everything, but I can remember walking, uh, going, walking to a meeting with the VP of Student Affairs who I had a dotted line to, and right, and a bulk of the meeting was going to be about my work, and right before we walked into the meeting room, he turned at me and looked at me and said, I don't want you saying anything during this meeting. I don't, I don't recall vividly the, the unique kind of, you know, circumstances that were going on at the time, but heading into a work, heading into a meeting 
<clears throat> when the main topic of discussion was going to be my work, and he turns and says, I don't want you saying anything at this meeting. Mm -hmm. So certainly a point where I felt diminished. <clears throat> so again, um, if you had a chance to think, I'd love to hear an example or two from here in the audience. Talk about a time you felt diminished or silenced at work. How did that make you feel? Was anything done to address it? Or a time that you felt supported or affirmed at work? Yes, I'll tell Yeah, um, it throws me back to when I joined the military out of high school. And uh, that was uh, difficult for me in many ways as my life unfolded. I was 18 at the time, and um, it was a time in the military when people were being kicked out of discharge for being openly gay. Um, and it created a lot of anxiety for those of us that were sort of in the closet and then just trying to come to terms with our identity is, you know, we wanted to serve in the military, but yet you've got, you know, a military that's not accepting of who you were as an individual. Now here we are where people can serve openly and uh, we've even to the point of now transgender people, depending on who's in office, of course, in our government, but, um, you know, it's been really good to see that movement, but back in that time, it was a, there was a lot of anxiety and a lot of challenge for me uh, being in the military. And, you know, I served my time, was discharged, and you know, I look back on it, I don't know if I would have stayed in at this point, uh, but that was certainly a, a reason that I decided to leave the military. Great. That's a great example, and we're gonna get to this later in the slides, but what is it about the environment or you, the way you lead your team that is not allowing folks to bring their full selves to the workplace. We'll, we'll get into a little bit of that. It sounds like that was your experience, that you weren't able to be your full self. Yep. Anyone else? Silenced or diminished at work or supported and affirmed? Okay, we won't pull teeth, <laughs> that's okay. I, I, I purposely try to um, cater my delivery style in a way <clears throat> that's going to have you wanting to lean in to learn more rather than recoil back. And I've been in DEI workshops particularly where the tone is more shame and blame, where it's like, you're racist, you're racist, this organization is racist, now go do your job. Um, that's not gonna be the case today. Yes, systemic racism exists, and yes, there are more aggressive ways that we need to go at that, but today, I wanna to open up more of a conversation and a dialogue around our work experiences. Um, so, if an uh, example to this opening icebreaker popped in your head later on, and you'd like to share, feel free to jump on in. I can share. Oh, please, go ahead. Yes. Um, when I first started at Ellis, I started as a tax, so like a nursing assistant, and I feel like my voice was definitely not always heard. Um, but then I kind of moved up and moved into administration. I feel a lot more supported. Yes. Great. That's another great example that our, um, unfortunately, often, whether or not we're valued or heard depends, I, I think, stems from both the position that we have on the flow chart, but also the particular identity that we also, you know, entail. Um, and then that's where we talk about kind of, uh, you know, um, the term I'm looking for, just blank. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'll come back to that. <laughs> I have another positive. Um, yes. When COVID started, you touched my, I was managing a unit that was snow. Yes. Switched all over to COVID, and your team worked very hard. Mm -hmm. and there wasn't a lot of positive reinforcement. It was just hard time. Yes. We can even ask you guys to do that. And then we got um, nominated for the Good News Award. Paul Mel came to me and asked me if I would receive the award as a nurse manager. And I asked him if I could bring members from my team as well, because I felt like that was going to be a positive for them. Um, I had done a lot of work, but really, they were the ones doing the, the majority of the work. You know, so it was really nice that I was able to bring um, not only myself, but um, some fellow nurses to uh, get the reward. I was able to talk and answer some questions. And um, I think it was really nice. Congratulations on that, and absolutely, I think, um, particularly in some fields like healthcare, you can do a lot of thankless jobs, a lot of unseen work, and I think 
um, not only Ellis being recognized, but then you going the step of saying, okay, I wanna make sure my team is seen, heard, and acknowledged from this award as well, and I think that was important to them. Intersectionality was the term I was coming back to, where we have some folks in this room have multiple identities intersecting at once, and sometimes they can be you know, all on the marginalized end. So you think of a heterosexual white male versus a black lesbian female, and the different paths, so to speak, that those individuals have to walk day to day, <clears throat> and the potential barriers that, that get in the way. <clears throat> so thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. All right, we'll go a little bit of the academic route. <clears throat> So as, you, as I explained, I'm from higher ed, and you know, several years ago on social media, the students were doing an <clears throat> awareness campaign to raise, uh, raise uh, awareness about microaggressions that people experience. And all the students simply did was hold up dry erase boards with things that were actually said to them by folks. So you'll see a number of slides throughout today where you see things like this, and it's actual term, you know, actual statements that were said to folks. <clears throat> So the goals are to create awareness by defining and describing what microaggressions are, exploring the outcomes, <clears throat> discovering tips, tools, and tactics to, uh, to both respond as well as minimize, and all of this is going to be in the effort of continuing to stay on a path of cultural competency. And cultural competency, much like other skill sets, is something that constantly needs sharpening, right? For those HR folks in the room, uh, if there are any, there are like HR credits every year that you have to get and attain to keep your HR certification valid. Um, I want us to view DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion work, as another realm of professional development that needs con continual kind of refreshing, going back to evolving. Think about just terminology alone. Think about the terms and language we used three, four, just three, four years ago and how in three or four years some of those terms could be deemed inappropriate. So it takes constant vigilance to kind of stay on top of this work. <clears throat> the term was coined in 1970 by a psychiatrist at Harvard University, Professor Chester Pierce, but more contemporarily, Dr. Wang Su from Columbia Teachers College in New York City has really advanced a lot of the awareness and research around microaggressions. So, um, I have a short video from Dr. Wang Su here. Oops, it's not in there. Good day, everyone. My name is Daryl Wang Su, and I am a professor of psychology and education at Teachers College, Columbia University. I am also author of Microaggressions in Everyday Life and microaggressions and marginality. Today, I would like to share with you some of the harmful impact that microaggressions have on marginalized groups in our society. But what are microaggressions? Well, microaggressions are the everyday slights, indignities, put downs, and insults that people of color, women, LGBT populations, or those who are marginalized experience in their day-to-day -day interactions with people. Microaggressions oftentimes appear to be a compliment, but contain a meta-communication or a hidden insult to the target groups in which it is delivered. People who engage in microaggressions are ordinary folks who experience themselves as good, moral, decent individuals. Microaggressions occur because they are outside the level of conscious awareness of the perpetrator. In this scene, Michael, an Asian American graduate student, is receiving academic counseling from his sponsor. They have a pleasant conversation. At the end of their meeting, the advisor delivers what he believes to be a compliment to Michael by stating, quote, you know you speak excellent English, end quote. Michael is disturbed because it seems to imply that he is not a true American and that he is a perpetual alien in his own country. Microaggressions can also be delivered not verbally through unconscious behaviors or gestures. In this scene, Jenny has finished the late night at the office and awaits the elevator. As the door opens, she takes one step forward, sees a black male rider, hesitates, and immediately clutches her purse 
and places her hand over her necklace. The hidden communication is that African Americans are prone to crime, will break the law, are up to no good, and will steal. Gender microaggressions occur also frequently to women. In this scene, Laura, a female manager, sits with her male colleagues in a meeting with the president. Note that the men tend to talk to one another, cut her off in mid-sentence, and that the president addresses only the males in the group. When Laura attempts to contribute to the discussion, she is oftentimes ignored. In one case, a male colleague checks his phone rather than listen. What can each and every one of us do to combat microaggressions? We need to realize that microaggressions are unconscious manifestations of a worldview of inclusion, exclusion, superiority, inferiority. Thus, our major task is to make the invisible visible. There are, in essence, five things that we need to do individually. First, learn from constant vigilance of your own biases and fears. Second, Experiential reality is important in interacting with people who differ from you in terms of race, culture, ethnicity. Thirdly, don't be defensive. Fourthly, be open to discussing your own attitudes and biases and how they might have hurt others or in some sense revealed bias on your part. Lastly, it is very important to be an ally. Stand personally against all forms of bias and discrimination. I wrote. Okay. So I feel like Dr. Wang Su does a good job of kind of capturing it. And again, verbal, behavioral, or environmental slights, often automatic and unintentional, occur in brief instances, in, in brief instances but on a daily basis. <clears throat> can, communi can communicate a hostile, derogatory, or negative viewpoint, and it perpetuates a worldview of inclusion and exclusion. There are a couple of different types of microaggressions, and I'll talk about a few of them today. Uh, Microassaults, microinsults, and validations, and environmental. Uh, Microassaults are often, these are often intentional. Verbal and nonverbal attacks clearly intended to offend the recipient through name calling avoided behavior or purposeful discriminatory actions. These are usually less likely than other forms of, uh, are less common than other forms of microaggressions, are more deliberate and conscious and uh, explicit and there's an intention to hurt, discriminate or exclude. An example might be refusing services to someone based on their sexual orientation. A micro insult are subtle snubs or humiliations that convey demeaning messages to the recipient in a way that may be unintentional by the offender. Um, they convey insensitivity or rude or demeaning individual's identity or heritage. Example could be complimenting someone by saying you're so articulate. A micro-invalidation <clears throat> is aimed to exclude, negate, or dismiss the thoughts, feelings, and experiences of the other person. An example might be an Asian American individual who was born and raised in the United States is complimented for speaking good English. An environmental microaggression is when micro-assaults, micro-insults, and micro-invalidations are reflected in the culture, processes, and climate of the workplace. An example might be, are some members of groups overrepresented in picture and marketing materials to the exclusion of some other groups? Okay. Microaggressions can have both individual and organizational impacts. While anyone can be on the negative end of microaggressive behavior, in my personal experience, microaggressions are disproportionately experienced by non-dominant groups. Depending on the setting, this can be women, people of color, those that are LGBTQIA+, foreign immigrants, and a number of other minoritized groups. They are counterproductive, microaggressions are to an inclusive workplace setting um, because it can have team-wide or even organization-wide impacts. So as employers, leaders of a team, ask yourself, again, going back to Father Tony's point, is there something about our specific team or company culture that prevents my staff from being or bringing their best selves on a daily basis? Right, when, when a tree or a plant is not yielding the fruit that you would like, you don't cut the tree down, right? 
We look at the environment that the tree is being raised in. We look at the soil, how often or how little it's being watered, what nutrients are in the soil. So if, similarly, if you have a team member or a staff member that isn't yielding or producing the outcomes or productivity that you would like to see, you don't immediately chip away and fire the employee. You look at the environment that that employee is operating in and you see what you can adjust or tweak to yield or uh, manifest the results that you would like. <clears throat> Some things to think about, and uh, these are rhetorical just for you to think. Are we using inclusive language on our websites, publications, hiring and onboarding materials? Are we using outdated terms for some social groups, like the term minorities? I know some people of color don't like that term minority, but here we are. Um, I've been doing DEI work for 15 plus years, and there's a lot about the language in DEI that I don't like. That I, this doesn't sit well with me, but there's no other better term that we have for it. But we're always talking about underrepresented, under-resourced, under, uh, underfunded, but if there's groups that are underrepresented, one would logically deduce that there's groups that are overrepresented, but we never hear that term, overrepresented. We never hear overfunded. We never hear, um, you know, it, it, there's deficit language, minorities, uh, underfunded, uh, at risk youth. Um, we tend to look at folks for, for the deficits they have rather than using positive language. Um, are you prepared to discuss and address DEI issues that even arise on your team in the workplace? If somebody brought two team members are having an issue over a cultural or something related to their identities and they bring it to you as a supervisor, are you even prepared to listen and respond accordingly? Do you try to learn the names of all your staff and coworkers and pronounce them correctly? Something relatively simple to grasp, but we don't see it implemented as much. I worked at Union, there was a young lady from Korea. She said, my name is Duyan, but call me Daisy. And after getting to know Daisy for a little while, I asked Daisy, hey Daisy, you know why do you, it's not that she didn't want to be called Duyan, it's that she picked Daisy to make it easier for her professors and friends to say her name. So think about that, think about this young lady, every time she walks into a class, she isn't even able to use the name that is on her birth certificate. She is checking a portion of herself at the door when she comes into that classroom or onto that campus. Think about, over the time, how that must chip away at one's soul. Think about those that are LGBT, that are not out at work, because maybe the work environment isn't conducive enough, the military environment wasn't conducive enough for folks to be out and think about that person is checking a major portion of their identity and their self at the door every time they come into the workspace. Are you able, as a leader, to get the, the fullest potential out of that person? I, I don't think so. So again, names, are you learning names, pronouncing them? Uh, do you treat all your staff and employees equitably? Do you make, tend to make less eye contact with some individuals than others? Do you respond differently to white colleagues versus those that are of color, women versus men? Again, things for us to think about. We all have biases. I think we covered that in the initial workshop. It's not a fault. We all have them. They're put there by our upbringing, by the messaging we receive. But if we're not careful, our biases can express themselves in overt decisions and, and thoughts. Um, so <clears throat> when, when a staff member is experiencing microaggressions at work, it has individual psychological consequences that range from anxiety, depression, sleep difficulties, diminished confidence, helplessness, loss of drive, intrusive cognitions, or what some of the literature calls the internal dilemma. And I would also like to say that I think unaddressed microaggressions can breed and feed into an imposter syndrome. Um, have, have folks heard that term, imposter syndrome? Okay. It, it, for, for folks that may not know that term, it basically means self-doubt. And it's like, you ever hit that point in your career where you're 10, 12 years in and you're like, do I deserve to be here? Did I earn this? Did, did, did I earn this spot that I'm, that I'm at in my career? Do, do, am I really making the impact with the work that I'm doing? Letting that doubt come up. And literature and research has shown that women and those in you know minoritized groups like people of color, that imposter syndrome can really come up for them. And 
uh, it's, it can be mitigated based on the supervisor relationship or the climate in the workplace. I know I'm moving a little quickly, but we do have a lot of content, so please, again, if there's any questions or comments, um, please don't hesitate to stop me. And I know that uh, most of the interactions that we'll be you know, thinking about today are you know, you all working with Ellis Promise students, but I also you know, put this up here specifically because um, I know that those microaggressions can even manifest in you know, patient caretaker kind of relationships where your patient even says something uh, that, you know, can you find me a doctor? Do you speak English? Um, my father-in-law, my wife's father, I love him to death, but he has a lot of that gender stuff. Like, you know, we've been living in our home 12 years and he's down in Kingston or Stonebridge, just out of Kingston, New York, and we're trying to get him, you know, to wrap his mind around moving up here. And we spent the day looking at homes, but it was, a, it was a woman that was the realtor. And I can tell just from the things he was saying and how he was responding, and he even like confirmed it later in the day when she was not in the room, but I can tell that if it was a male realtor, he would have been acting and responding to her differently that day. Um, okay. Another, another video. And this one you might have seen if you were on the, um, keep clicking along. Who even uses Internet Explorer anymore? I'm sorry. <laughs> Who's don't think that for people who still don't think that microaggressions are a problem? Oh, you're so well spoken. Oh, just imagine instead of being a stupid comment, a microaggression is a mosquito bite. Ugh, it's a compliment. <laughs> oh. Mosquito bites and their itch are one of nature's most annoying features. But if you're only bitten every once in a while, no, where are you really from? Uh. Sure, it's annoying, but it's not that big a deal. The problem is that some people get bitten by mosquitoes a lot more than other people. I mean, a lot more. Whether it's on a date. Oh, your English is so good. Excuse me? Going grocery shopping. You know, everything happens for a reason. I'm just by that. Commuting to work. So what do you got to have a baby? Watching TV. We have to keep the red chain thing. Work of culture and history. Or just walking down the street with your partner. I couldn't even tell you were gay. <sighs> Mosquitoes seem to pop up everywhere. Do you know John? You shot me so much here too. And getting bit by mosquitoes every day. Touch your hair. Multiple times a day. It's annoying. That means you want to go full plastic on those mosquitoes. Which seems like a huge overreaction to people who only get bit every once in a while. It's just a mosquito bite. Who cares? Just another angry black one. Of course, beyond just being annoying. Some mosquitoes carry truly threatening diseases that can mess up your life for years. Astrophysics? Hmm. Maybe you should try this challenging major. Ah, dreams. And other mosquitoes carry strings that can even kill you. Look like you was up to Trump, okay? I thought correct. So next time you think someone's overreacting, just remember, some people experience mosquito bites all the time. You're all so exotic, wow. And by mosquito bites, we mean microaggression. Oh. Okay, light target for comedic purposes, but I think it conveys the point nonetheless in that um, there are some folks who experience it a lot more than others, and it could seem like, uh, uh, why, are you re why, are you, why are you reacting this way to the other person? And we'll, we'll get into some other, some other terms here, but the, so I mentioned the internal dilemma, the different um, psychological consequences that an individual can have when they experiencing them. And you know, I just want you to take a look at this slide. Did I interpret that correctly? Did this person just say what I thought they said? What do they mean by that? Should I say something? Saying something may make it worse. Oh, I got that twice. I got a typo. I got to address that. <laughs> They'll probably think I'm overreacting. Speaking up is going to hurt more than helps. My head hurts just looking at the slide. So imagine this being your mental state coming into the workplace and these things are happening to you. Um, again, are you able to really get the maximum amount of productivity and engagement from a staff member if this is what they're experiencing day to day? Okay, let's talk about how to respond. So 
Most microaggressions go unaddressed and most people do not confront them, but confronting them can help the other person or even people involved to realize their bias and potentially change their behavior. Confronting also sets the norm that this type of behavior is not okay in the workplace or anywhere else for that matter, and effectively working to avoid committing them as well as addressing them will make it less likely that others will do or say the same thing. So on a macro level, and this is again thinking organization-wide on a macro level, A, modeling a culture of respect. Whether it's Paul Milton out down to this guy painting the doors outside, regardless of who you encounter, respect has to be key. Um, and, and the amount of respect one gets should not be uh, uh, predicted by their identity or their position in this organization. So respect needs to be key. Modeling a culture of respect. Being difference conscious, not difference blind. Part of the ableist term, difference blind. But we want you to be difference conscious, not difference blind. You know, I meet those folks that, oh, I don't see color. I treat everyone the same. And I think folks genuinely think they are meaning well when they say that. But that's not where we want to be. We want to be in a place where you see me for my color, you see me for my disability, you see me for my sexual orientation. You go the further step of trying to understand what it's like, and then you operate from there. And knowing that not everybody is coming from the same starting point. This, I treat everyone the same, I don't see color, diminishes folks and minimizes the, unique, the uniqueness that they have. Model the organizational values relative to DEI. If somewhere on your website, and I believe there is somewhere on your website where it says, we respect diversity, equity, inclusion, and we, we, it's important, then you need to be living that out day to day in how you treat people and how you treat your staff. And developing an action and outcome-based DEI plan, and this training is part of that. So kudos to Ellis for having a plan and taking the steps uh, consistently to, to move forward. So if you're deciding to respond as an individual, one thing you might want to think about is both your role and your goal. Your goal and your role. So what do you want to accomplish? What is your relationship to the aggressor, for the lack of a better term? And possible bystanders. So when your goal is actually to affect someone's bias, the most effective responses are polite rather than hostile and focus on positive qualities rather than accusations of prejudice. I've noticed that you get more bees with honey and it's why I opened up the way I opened up. That when I deliver a workshop, I want to deliver the content in a way that wants you to lean in and learn more, not recoil back and want to just stay away from other workshops of that nature. So sometimes when you want to actually connect with someone, even if they've ouched you or wronged you in a way, approaching them in a polite way rather than hostile is going to get to the results. Some possible interventions or intervention tactics. Um, one is simply inquiry. Just saying, what did you mean by that? Can, can you tell me a little bit more? Sometimes that's enough to get the person to kind of even realize that what they said could be offensive. Paraphrasing and reflecting is where you say what the person said to you back to them and give them a mo moment to reflect. So, Tony, what I think I heard you say is this, and say it back to them. Am I, did I get that correct? And sometimes that's enough to get the person to hear their own words back to them, and now they're taking a minute to stop, pause, and think. Using I statements. So rather than saying, you know, Tony, you said this in the meeting the other day, and that's messed up, and you got to really work on that, and that's coming from a bad place, that's going to put Father Tony on the defensive. But rather, when I heard that statement that was uttered in the meeting the other day, this is how it impacted me. This is how I felt the rest of the day. Using I statements. Interrupting and reframing sometimes in the moment, if it's in a large group setting, and you know, sometimes interrupting or reframing or just kind of pivoting away from the statement is important. And then um, another one I have here, or the last one for this section is called revisit. Sometimes in the moment is not the right time to address it and you have to come back and revisit. Again, going back to my Union College example, there was a professor leading a Monday, Wednesday class and it was a Monday and it was the end of class and the students were getting their coats and jackets on and a student said something that was offensive and a couple of students in the room, you know, kind of raised their eyebrows and the professor could see that they were bothered by it but half the students were out of the class, half of them were in 
And the professor, frankly, was a little kind of taken aback and kind of deer in headlights, didn't know what to do in that moment. So they chose to let it go. And on Wednesday, when the class reconvened, the professor said, you know, something happened at the end of class last time on Monday, and I want to come back to that and talk about it for a minute and debrief. So sometimes, depending on the situation, coming back to the scenario is better after some time has passed. Um, you know, we used to do this thing in higher ed, and it seems a little silly, but after talking with folks, it's, it's, it's simple, but it's, it can be powerful if you buy into it. But we used to do this thing called ouch hoops. And it's an agreed upon kind of thing by folks in a, in a team where if I say something or do something that's offensive, a simple ouch is audibleized in that room by somebody that was offended. And then the person who said the statement is supposed to say oops. And at some point, those two folk are supposed to get together and kind of debrief where the friction or where the rub was. Um, it's, it's, it can be powerful. It can be a way of publicly acknowledging that something happened so that person who's experienced it isn't sitting in their head saying, oh, did I just hear that correctly? Because an ouch is said in the room. Um, so buy into the ouch oops. And again, it might seem a little silly at first, but at least it's a way to get everybody kind of focused on the same it also creates like a, a, it creates a doorway for a connection and understanding, rather than most of this times when this happens, the person who's experienced it bottles it in, doesn't say anything, the person who maybe made the statement doesn't even know, and now there's this weird friction in between that person, whether it's supervisor, supervisor, or colleague, there's a friction there that's going unspoken, that's affecting their work, their ability to work on a team, and so the ouch whoops at least Kind of puts that in public and then offers a way for the two to connect. Um, focusing on monitoring smaller behaviors. I really want to talk about the power of the bystander. There is often a third party or parties in the room when things like this happen. Um, so really what should be promoted is a workplace culture where everybody's both informed and empowered to address this. Um, I've noticed that there have been a few times with my supervisor over the last four years where I've had to like say, hey, can we, can we take a time out and can we take our professional hats off for a minute and have a real conversation, a kind of a frank conversation? And it might be a little uncomfortable in the moment because we're, we're really kind of talking a little bit more frankly, but I can attest that we've been better as a team for those conversations. It's in that difficult, it's in that uncomfortable stuff that really can lead to further understanding. So um, if you're a leader of a team, promoting that kind of open dialogue nature where if things come up for people, they should feel open coming to you. They should feel open discussing it rather than just kind of acting like it's not happening. Um, and I will say that if it's persistent and personal, there is a line that can be crossed in which warrants reaching out to a supervisor more formally or HR. So I, I want to make sure that we don't, um, that we mention that. And most people will feel negative emotions when confronted, but they can still learn from the experience. Some, you know, as the person looking to address it, be aware that anger, denial, dismissal, or minimization, feeling like they were attacked, so they're gonna attack back, claiming it was just a joke, trying to explain your, mis your misinterpretation of what they said or did, um, freezing or closing up, trying to get others to agree with their behavior, and hopefully eventually apologizing and trying to make up for it. So um, some strategies, some additional strategies in addition to the one I just said. Appeal to values. That's one way to appeal to values. An example, you're really too smart to believe that. I think it's like, what is it, 90% of the scientific community agrees that climate change is real, but you're there are still people who disagree or, or think that doesn't. Uh, express your feelings. That hurts my feelings. Again, that hurts my feelings because it's gonna go a lot further than you said this and you were wrong. Get them to explain, as mentioned earlier, what did you mean by that? Empathize with the underlying feeling. I know it's hard to find a job after college, but affirmative action is not the problem. Give information, actually most People on welfare are white. Use humor. Wow, you sound a lot like my grandpa. 
Involve others. Yes, that was our question. Yes. You don't feel like you're too smart to leave that. Is that all my relevant? I got this from some literature, and I do think that that statement is a, could be a little harsh depending on how it's delivered, but I think it's more like um, sometimes, often, quite frankly, people exhibit behavior that, if they had the time to reflect and think about, does not align with their core values. And sometimes I think getting people to go back to that value. It's almost like saying like, I know your mama raised you better. Like, like if, if w would you say that if other people were listening? It's almost like, um, I know you and I know you know better, almost kind of like that. Um, so maybe even though I found it from a literary source, I'll change the way that one's worded, but I think the, 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 the tactic is to really, uh, not address the actual statement, but try to like appeal to the underlying value that the person might have. Involve others, did you hear that? Sometimes folks, um, until there's a, a, a kind of critical mass of others that realize that that behavior was wrong, it might impress upon that person a little bit more. And while kind of passive aggressive, depending on the situation, uh, you can use nonverbal responses as well. Because again, depending on the situation, a verbal confrontation or a verbal kind of conversation isn't gonna be possible, but you wanna like let the person know that you disagree with the behavior in a way. Okay, um, I you know left this little acronym here. Um, but if you experience one, uh, if the microaggression was made by a single person, you can hold them accountable it's good to approach and talk to them before filing a formal complaint. By doing this, you take the high road and you try to mitigate the conflict. And sometimes all you're asking for is a simple apology and maybe a correction of behavior. Uh, but if they're a repeat offender and you feel like you tried to address this multiple times and it's not going anywhere, you don't need to continually take the high road. I would say write down your thoughts. Writing down your thoughts is a good way to calm your nerves and make you feel relaxed. And moreover, when you express your thoughts on paper, you're able to recall times, sometimes with more vivid detail, where you might have felt invalidated or stereotyped. Um, and also, if you do decide to go the route of filing a formal complaint, sometimes having a written record of behavior is, is helpful. Um, you can, when you know jotting down your thoughts, think about a time when you felt a microaggression. How did you feel after it? Did it, did it affect your mental health or self-esteem? And what uh, what did you wish you would have said to the person who made that statement? Take a deep breath. This one is key. Assume offense was not the intent. Try to the best degree possible to assume that offense was not the intent. Explain how the slight could be interpreted by other folks, whether on your team or with an earshot. Um, Sometimes asking follow-up questions. Who were you referring to when you said that? What did you mean by that? Um, and identify individuals that you feel comfortable discussing with, whether family member, or colleague, or a mentor. If the perpetrator, again, for lack of a better term, denies being offensive, ask yourself, will further conversation be beneficial and productive? What is my current level of stress? Um, and am I, am I able to respond non-emotionally? I think, um, <coughs> Well, I don't want to promote the message that emotion has no place in the workplace. I think it does. I think sometimes with these situations, if we respond overly emotional to the person, it does not allow that person to, to, to really look at the behavior and they're responding to your emotions rather than what, what you're, the message you're trying to get across to them. Reiterate that you're not blaming the person, only expressing how the comment made you feel. Explain that instances like this occur on a daily basis and be open to their input and expression of their feelings. And again, coming back to this point, many times we fail to align our words and actions with our ideology. Many of us have even committed microaggressions in the workplace or elsewhere. As far as it's unintentional, there's ways to rectify it. Um, if you have unintentionally carried a microaggression in the workplace, it doesn't mean that you're insensitive. However, you must confront such, a, such situations and take them as an opportunity to learn. Recognizing your own privilege allows space to be listened to marginalized communities and um, admit your mistake. I would also say if, you're, if you've committed one, 
to not react defensively, try to listen with an empathetic heart, right? Empathy is the, is the end goal here. With much of this DEI work, empathy is the end goal. But we can never get to empathy if we don't have understanding, and we will never get to understanding if there isn't exposure. And I, um, I, if we're not careful, even in 2023, we can have folks that live, work, play, and pray with only people that look like them. And there's very little exposure. I find that that, I gather that that might be different here in Schenectady, and you probably don't have that issue, because I've walked these halls and I've been in this building and this community is very diverse. But I am still often in 2023, talking to individuals that live, work, play, and pray with only people that look like them. And I wonder, how are you ever gonna develop empathy for other if you're not even exposed or understand them? Um, so listen with an empathetic heart, acknowledge the pain that you caused, and apologize. Um, you know, I, I, I underline this one and I put it in bold red font because I wanna make sure I say this in these workshops. We live in a connected world where lack of awareness cannot be the excuse anymore. We live in a connected world where lack of awareness cannot be the excuse anymore. Um, whether it's this workshop, whether it's issues that have played out in the media, whether it's you know just general literature and resources and services and uh, to, to kind of raise awareness around these issues, there are things out there that uh, can raise awareness about this and what we can do about them. So, um, you know, having that lack of awareness cannot be an excuse after a while. It's the no better, do better. Um, any questions? Any comments? Okay. That's a lot more quiet than the last two groups. <laughs> A lot more. Um, additional concepts. <coughs> oh, so I'm sorry. Before, before we move on to that, just um, again for uh, for individuals recognizing uh, this is after the confrontation. For individuals recognizing that dismissive attitudes are harmful, <coughs> engaging in self-reflection to identify times. Um, Participating in continuing education and avoid making assumptions. And for institutions, fostering inclusive and supportive environments. Collaborate with groups and organizations who are committed. Um, I was talking with Deb in HR and she mentioned that there was a recent HR issue with two employees and that one of the employees happened to be of the Guyanese community and they reached out to a pastor here at a local Guyanese church and brought that pastor in to help you know, mitigate this conflict that these two employees were having. And that's, you know, a beautiful example of reaching out to, you know, the village of resources that are out there um, that are available. And I'd like to, you know, put myself in the chamber out as one of those um, sources as well. Some additional concepts to consider. I want to talk about intent versus impact. Intent versus impact. I think often when these things occur, we hear that I didn't mean it that way, it was just a joke. Um, and I think some will try to you know, get out of the behavior by saying that in a response. I actually had this, this conversation with my son this weekend. Um, but I would say that that's focusing on the intent, right? Uh, when we need to be focusing on the impact. If you're coming down the hall and you step on my toe by accident, even though it wasn't your intention and it was an accident, it still hurts my toe, right? And I think in these moments, very often, it's, oh, you're blowing it out of proportion. I didn't mean it that way. That is very much focusing on the intent. And we need to be focusing on the impact, the harm that was caused. Um, <clears throat> whenever communication happens, there are two folks involved. There's a sender and a receiver. And I would say, I would argue that the sender of a communication does not really get to predict how the receiver receives it. So this is why it's important for us to use inclusive language and be on top of this, because you don't know how you might mean things to be one way and how it's received another. Um, I'll use an extreme example, but I use it to paint a picture. If I lived in the woods and you know I wanted to keep my family warm and all I needed was some firewood and I go and chop a tree down, my intentions in that endeavor are noble. I'm trying to provide for my family, but let's say there was a bald eagle's nest at the top of that tree 
and now look what I've done to this, this you know, nature and the environment. Um, it wasn't my intention, but the impact is, can still be negative. So when these moments occur, uh, we cannot allow the person to just get away with, I didn't mean it that way. It has to, there's still a moment there, yes? I think that a lot, um, for me, a lot of what happens when you're having DEI conversations, the point is for people to understand the other person's point of view and the other, so if you're only focused on, well, I didn't mean that to happen, you're still focused on you. Yes. You need to be aware of what what the impact is on the other person, because that's the point. Yes, very much so. I agree, and I think that um, it can be difficult in this particular moment, because I think a person is being kind of challenged or corrected or called out for behavior, and it's natural human, you know, to kind of get a little defensive and to not want to be seen in that way. So there's a there's a there's a gut reaction to kind of protect my image or protect my reputation and focus on me, and then in that the impact of what we've done or said can be lost. Yes, Jason, I I have a natural curiosity about people's stories, their life stories. It's just it comes along with chaplaincy, but there are times where I've caught myself. You know, I might say, oh, well, where, where are you from? And I've used that, and, you know, and then I'm embarrassed because I'm thinking, oh, what are they thinking like? You know, where, where I'm, you know, being this microaggression. Right. So I have to, you know, I'll apologize and kind of explain myself, and sometimes it's a non-issue, but sometimes it could be for others. So, you know, that's one of my weaknesses that I think about where it comes from. You know, it's not, I don't intend it to be a microaggression, out of natural curiosity and somebody's story and that sort of thing, yes. but it can be received, like you said, as an aggression. So I have to be careful about that. And I do, I, I, you know, going back to what the slide said earlier, I do think that 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 as the person experiencing it, we have to try to assume that, in, that <laughs> offending me was not the intention. Right. But at times it can still offend. So I think we just need to, you know, my hope is that with all of these sessions, that you know, folks will leave out of here with the your perspective just a little wider. And when your perspective is just a little wider, you're able to see things and zoom in and kind of focus on things that maybe your perspective wasn't able to pick up earlier. Um, and that's you know part of the hope of this. Um, <clears throat> I want to, you know, one other additional top concept is cumulative impact, cumulative impact where, Father Tony, that might be the first time that you said that to that person, where are you from? But that might be the 700th time that that person has had that said to them. And we've got to be aware of that dynamic as well. It's kind of the straw that broke the camel's back kind of thing where, and then you're, if they were to respond like overly kind of negative, you're like, oh my gosh, where's all that coming from? You know, yeah. it, it, it seems like an overreaction to you, but there's not that understanding that this might be the, the sixth time that that person has had that said to them just that day. Um, so cumulative impact, um, I also have on here, we must allow the space to allow people to be the experts of their own lived experience. We must allow the space to allow people to be the experts of their own lived experience. Um, I, I'm, I don't, I'm not an expert in anything, but if there was something I could label me, me I, 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 the closest thing I'm an expert in is me. And I'm gonna allow you all to be the experts in you. So when something happens or something is said to you and you're offended by it, it's not my job to say, you shouldn't feel that way. You know, that person didn't mean it that way and kind of dismiss it. I'm gonna allow the space for you to be the expert in you. And I think that we <clears throat> sometimes struggle with allowing that uh, to happen. Um, I said earlier, much like any other skill set, being culturally competent or even a step further, I'd like to say culturally responsive, but being culturally competent just means that you're prepared to be the multicultural, multi-religious, multi-racial, multi-ethnic, you know, uh, multi-ability types of conversations and situations and teamwork. Um, The importance of inclusive language, let me see, let me just see, I'm gonna, all right. Um, and then, so I'll talk a little bit about the importance of inclusive language, and we'll, and then I'll list off what I think are some in, encouraged shifts 
not really uh, getting you to, to wipe away er everything, but to just think about things a little bit differently. Um, what is inclusive language and why does it matter? Inclusive language is the daily practice of communicating intentionally using unbiased words that acknowledge diversity, convey respect, and support an environment of equitable opportunity. The words daily practice are critical in this definition. Inclusive language is not simply an idea or an aspiration. It comes to life and generates impact only when it's routinely practiced in everyday workplace conversations and written communications. Consistent use of inclusive language can have a significant positive effect on company's culture, performance, and profitability. Why? Because language shapes human relationships and people are at the heart of our organizations. So inclusive language honors that each person's diverse identity, making them feel welcome, valued, and empowered to do their best work. And productive collaboration is driven by inclusive communication, as is teamwork and trust. And sometimes it's the smaller patterns of our daily lives that subtly enforce exclusion and discrimination. So I would practice inclusive language. Um, you know, some of the stuff that's embedded in our language that we don't even realize. If I would say, all right, guys, now we're done with that portion and we're gonna move on to the, I just said guys to a mixed gender room of folks. That is so commonplace in our language. I actually flipped that on a group of young men at Union and I said, all right, gals, let's go get some lunch. And they immediately, like looked at me like I had lobsters coming out of my ears, but think about how often we just say, hey guys, to a room full of men and women. It's just embedded in our language. Um, we think about also some of the euphemisms and little kind of sayings that we use in this language. Uh, as we're in this period where immigration is a big kind of issue, you're gonna have folks immigrating here from other countries. You probably have many of them on staff right now. So simple things like, oh, let's go, to all, let's go to all the ducks in a row for that meeting on Monday. What the hell is ducks in a row to somebody who wasn't born in the United States? It's just like, it's just terminology that we use. We don't even examine it day to day. And could it be preventing or putting some barriers into that workplace that are unintended? So to the best degree possible, don't use little euphemisms or terms, you know, Things like that. Just say, let's get all of our affairs in order for that meeting. Let's get all our, you know, do we have everything we need for that meeting that's coming up? Um, it's interesting, Jason. Yes. We were looking at the, the mission for the School of Nursing the first year that I came back. And so in 1903, the School of Nursing only educated women. And she was not allowed to learn nursing, to be honest. Hmm. And so then, since the house started, <laughs> <laughs> the men in the past, um, the, the the mission has said that we educate men and women to become registered professional nurses. So, you know, I'm in academia, you gotta bring everything that you wanna change to everyone in the universe. And so we brought it, brought it to faculty org. So we're gonna individ, we're gonna educate either individuals or people. But it's not just gonna be men and women anymore. So nobody gets to pick, but we're gonna pick. So we're educating individuals now because because men and women doesn't suffice. Right. And there are some folks in our society that don't consider them, that, that, that those terms men and women would not apply to how they see themselves and identify. And it's in, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. You know, we've tried to just say good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, you know, rather than saying, you know, so it's like that little change in language doesn't really impact my greeting to a group of folks. It's just good morning. But it could be the world of difference to someone else and not, when I worked at U Union College did not admit women until the 1970s. They've been there since 1795, 1795, and did not start enrolling women until 1970 something. So, and just recently, um, well, even more recently, since I left, uh, they changed the uh, mascot. It's not, it, it used to be the Dutchman, Union College Dutchman, um, and now it's a light a guard. Guard, guarded Chargers, right? So Union College Guarded Chargers, and of course it's the alums on social media that have way more problems with that than the current students. And this is the other thing, is like, like tune into young folks, listen to young folks, give them a clap, open up space for young folks to talk to you and you will be amazed at how much. You think you're in that space to just lead or teach? 
I tell you, I've been, I'm around youth often, and, and you'll be amazed how much learning you do when you are around youth. And the, the, even the term safe space gets a lot of flack in the media. Safe space doesn't mean we're gonna, that you're gonna enter a situation and you're not gonna be challenged or that we're gonna put nerf on the walls and you're only gonna be you know, with opinions that, I've seen some of the most difficult and courageous conversations happen in a safe space. It's just safe in that we're intentionally laying down the ground rules for how we're gonna engage so that nobody's gonna be pounced on. Nobody's gonna jump down your throat if you say the wrong thing. But think about those. So they changed the, local, they changed the um, mascot and the name of the athletics. And while I was there, um, the, the alma mater, the, 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 you know, the song they would sing at graduation had um, some, one line was like, we are all brothers under the, I forget the exact line, but it didn't, it said brothers in there. And, you know, the, the, particularly the young ladies on campus fought hard to try to get that changed. And eventually that was changed and now it says, I forget exactly the words, but it's more inclusive. I do a lot of work with persons with disabilities and we should say and lecture, well, let's get up and take a 10 minute stretch break. Yes. Okay. Yes. So the wheelchair dependent person. Correct. I, I'm not gonna do anything different than what I'm doing right now. Right. So it's just, if you don't think about that, you think about. <clears throat> exactly, and I try now, if I, I say, if you're willing and able, if you're willing and able, please stand and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but yes, often we can get at the same goal and just tweak a little bit our language you use, or how, you know, but it, it'll make the world of difference for that person that is just dying to be included in terminology or in, you know, how you label uh, folks. So, um, let's see. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, these are great examples, and I love the engagement. What I uh, just some encouraged mind shifts from my point of view. And I borrowed these from Deacon Greg Owens. He's a deacon at Macedonia Baptist Church in Albany. He used these um, as part of a presentation under a different concept, context. But I found the ideas to be profound, so I borrowed them for this. But I would say, where possible, let us move from lenses to mirrors. Let us move from lenses to mirrors. Rather than looking at a person or a community, through the lens of a problem that you're there to fix, reflect and change that lens to a mirror, reflect on you and try to be the best service provider that you can be. Um, because I think, again, very often, particularly in this setting, particularly in this setting, healthcare, you're, you're, you enter a room and you've got a lens on like, what's the issue, how can I fix it? Um, and I would like us where possible, obviously can't do this all the time when there's a pressing you know, a medical need, but at least with your team, rather than looking at, oh, here comes this one down the hall, like rather than thinking about the issues or the problems that this person brings to your day, try to turn that lens to a mirror and reflect on you being a better leader, supervisor. Second one, let us try to remove relationships, let us try to move relationships from transactional to transformational, from transactional to transformational. Again, for those of you that are gonna be leading a team, is your dialogue with that staff member rather transactional where, okay, we gotta get through this week's one-on-one, -on -one. we gotta sit here for 15 minutes, okay, and then I'm on to my next thing? Or are you using that moment to kind of build up the team dynamic that you want so that that team vibe is transformational for everyone on the team? So again, let's try to move from transaction, let's try to move, remove, let's try to move relationships from transactional to transformational. And then the last encouraged mind shift that I can kind of encourage is let us try to move from problem solving to possibility creating. Problem solving to possibility creating. So when someone comes to your office with an issue, rather than looking at it as a, as a <coughs> problem per se that needs to be solved, what possibilities can you create with that? Um, and again, slight differences, but I think it can lead to profound shifts in our work if we're able to just embrace um, some mind shifts there. Um, this is the point in the training where we didn't get to with the last two because the folks were very, uh, they had a lot of questions and comments, and I don't wanna 
force folks, but I'd love to be able to get to do some role plays if we could. Um, but I understand that that might be a little bit outside of folks' comfort level at the moment if you're on the spot here. Um, but um, cultural competency refers to one's ability to understand and respect people. This includes beliefs, customs, norms, values from people of different backgrounds. You know, just thinking about the time of the year we're in. Um, there are, we, we operate on a very Christian-centric calendar. We, re we operate on a very Christian-centric calendar with how we acknowledge holidays. And um, we have to understand that, that not everybody celebrates Christmas, right? That there are religions outside of Christianity that are in these four walls. And how, what are we doing to acknowledge that or to show uh, equal kind of priority? Um, I understand that in some areas it takes a critical mass of folks to raise awareness. So for example, in New York City, I believe um, there's, there's now a, the students have a day off of school during Ramadan. And I believe also just this year coming up for 2024, Lunar New Year, we'll have a holiday associated with it in New York City schools for our Asian community. Um, we, so we have a multicultural holiday calendar on our chamber website. We're actually updating it for 2024 now. And you'll go to the top and it'll, at the top it'll give you the month long observances for that month. But then throughout each month it'll also list from a multi-religious, multicultural back uh, perspective, it'll list holidays that are important to folks. Um, yeah, yes. Um, we use that calendar, by the way, it's on your website. Right. Your <laughs> it's a it's good kind of guide what we put out and we do. I think we've gotten better over the last few years since we intentionally sort of DEI to recognize more diversity in our religious and cultural celebrations that are out there. One of the things we did recently is our chapel upon A6, um, we had some, we had all the religious icons of the major religions on the wall. So we had some folk come to us and say, those religious icons are in the direction of east where we pray, mm -hmm. and we would like them moved, rearranged. So, you know, we accommodated that. So it was a really nice example of how, when you can respect others' needs, that, you know, there's a way to make that happen mm -hmm. and uh, just to celebrate other people and let, give them the space that they need. Yes. Yeah. Your colleague that works with you here in the religious, he was in the last training? That was probably Rich Moran. Rich, yes. Yeah. He, he shared that story. Okay, good. He shared that story. Yeah. Because there was another staff member there that I guess has somebody that, you know, uh, of the religion of Islam in their team. Yes. And she wasn't aware of that prayer meditation space, I believe on the sixth floor, right? So she was kind of saying, well, what do I do? And then when she finished, four of the people in the room were like, oh, we have a space like that. Yeah. And then, so it's great that you have that space for people to go pray. But you went even a step further that after you carved out the space, Muslims who are praying face east, and I heard there was a Buddha and maybe another Christian iconography in front of them, right. and they just simply asked that it be moved, not removed from the room, but just removed from that east wall so that they're not looking at another yeah. religion's deity while they're praying. And we've enhanced the reading materials that are in there. We've got a, you know, Jewish reading, a, a readings from uh, the, the Muslim faith, and I think even Buddhist readings now. We've got um, you know, labyrinth uh, work mm -hmm. that can yes. be done in there. That's, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, that's phenomenal, and I, you know, it's, it's uh, it's not an attack on Christmas if somebody says happy yeah, holidays or season exactly. greetings to you. You know, it's just their way of trying to be a little bit more inclusive with, yeah. with you know, this time of the year um, without assuming that you're celebrating Christmas. Jason, I just want to comment. Yeah. I think we have to also remember the, like, the terms cultural or marginalized, like, instead of thinking of them narrow focus, but we have to think of them even bigger because, you know, some people have it. If you said culture to somebody, they might have six definitions of you know what culture is and what culture means to them or how that is interpreted and the same thing. So I have a, a son who would not, you know, is a white thirty year old who would not fit into what somebody might think is a marginalized group because not visibility. Mm -hmm. But he's a member of a motorcycle club and he has tattoos. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when people see him, yes. you know, and he's in his letters and he's, you know, gotten off his Harley, he's 
stereotypes. stereotypes mm -hmm. right into a group of oh my god that's a hell's angel or, or something along the big biker dude you know that's it's a biker like, dude or, or the word that comes up is a gang right yes. we don't think of them as motorcycle clubs we call them motorcycle gangs yes so we've already put him into a grouping yes. right which isn't what this group is about this group is actually founded out of um it's out of queens and it's its whole mission for being is those who perished or were were impacted by 9-11, as many of them um, had parents that died in 9-11, and this whole group comes, goes to the ground zero every year, reads the names mm -hmm. at 9-11 ceremonies and participates in all the fundraisers for you know families and all that stuff. So this group's got a true mission, but when we see, or the yes. tattoos are seen, and Donald, just think back in the day in nursing where a tattoo was just, you, a nurse couldn't have it. I mean, that was just not absolutely, positively not. Like, what are you going to do, lop off your arm? I mean, there are no things that were so, that were just so funny. But right, the day was, oh my God, you had a tattoo, there was no way you were coming to nursing school because that was just not going to be okay. You know, so I just think, we, you know, as we talk about all this, you know, these words, right, that people have a very broad definition of what culture needs or a marginalized group needs because it isn't about true culture, it isn't about true religion, it isn't true about color, it's about any group, mm -hmm. regardless, you know, persons with disabilities certainly falls in there, but, you know, that feel marginalized for any reason. Yes. You know, it could be a whole, you know, it could be a certain church in a certain community, even though all the people look the same, mm -hmm. you know, have a different faith, but, you know, belief, yes. or whatever it is, it just, I just, you know, I think we always kind of remind people that these terms are very broad, and not, yes. And they are what the person says they are. Cool. You know, yes. that's your point of me. Right. This is what There's I. There's even a unique culture on the, in this hospital, right. or on this floor, on this team that can have its own culture. 100%. I agree with everything. I think that um, it's tough to cram a lot into 90 minutes, and I would love to have like a one on one kind of get us all on a baseline of what do those terminology mean, and then we can, you know, get into a deeper conversation. But, you know, again, we're, we're a lot of the time that we're allotted, and, and I know that you have very busy jobs and difficult jobs, and I know that it's easy sometimes for the, the, the other main things to be the priority, but this, this stuff, this language, how people are treated, what people experience, is, is at play day to day, and sometimes more so for some individuals, than, than we realize, and uh, it's at play more than we acknowledge at times, and I think Many times, it's affecting one's experience with their supervisor, with their colleagues, with you know the whole organization, and so I think um, as not only for recruitment but for retention purposes, you know what can we do to really take a deep dive and look at the company culture here at Ellis? What's it like? What's it like team? You know, team to team. Do folks feel like they can bring their whole selves in? Uh, and if not, again, is there something about the culture here that's preventing that? Um, but yes, you know, that's, a, that's age. Things mean different things to different people, for sure. Yeah. Age. age is one. In the ED, you know, somebody's history of alcoholism or somebody's history of drug use automatically, you know, puts them in a different, mm -hmm. you know, could have them seen through a different lens. Absolutely. You know. Yes. I want to be a little controversial and uh, I'm going to say So okay. I will frequently say, like, I'm hurting cats, right? Or my dog's are really well, right? So that's part of, like, So when, when are you putting more self, you know, like, you have, everyone says like, you should have a thick skin or, you know, all those little things. Like, when are you putting your, are you trying to go out of the way to not be yourself, mm -hmm. to accommodate other people? Like, when does it? I think with those particular examples, particularly if you're leading a team and other people look up to you, then I think it's incumbent upon leaders to try to do whatever they can to operate verbally or, or you know, body language in a way that's going to bring the best out of those folks. So if ducks in a row, if there's another way that, if there's another term that you could, on the easier side, just change that to a different terminology that would make it easier for someone to understand, I guess my question would be why wouldn't you want to do that? Um, I, I could see that there, it gets to a point where maybe there's some stronger things that you want to hold on to as you know your personality, your upbringing, your culture that are important to you. But I would ask 
I guess depending on the situation and depending on the examples, um, to you know, again, to try to understand that that your singular worldview is just that a singular worldview, and that it has to come into contact with various other worldview through uh, various other worldviews throughout the day. So if you want to try to lead with empathy, lead inclusively, and particularly if you're leading a team, I would encourage, you know, if it's if it's smaller vernacular things, why wouldn't we want to shift a few things we say? You know, I guess, and I don't think you're being controversial. I actually like when we have this discussion. I, 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 I like the different- another example that I really can't say a lot of the person, so I'm trying to get them to understand yes. more, so I guess I'm just trying to pull some more information. Yes. No, I know. I, you know, I know so without <laughs> trying to, you know, go to pull HR into, but, um, you know, certain people are like, well, that's me, so I want to do it, and they get to do them, so why can't I do me? And, you know, it's, I do think that at a place of employment, there is certain behavior that's encouraged and certain that's not, and I think that, you know, um, I do think that you don't want to do this infinitely to the point, because I do think that if somebody brings in something that could be counterproductive to the team, and they want that viewpoint acknowledged in some way, if it's counterproductive, it's kind of, you know, like if it's, if, if it's gonna have a bad result, it's gonna have a bad result, but I think explaining to that person why, um, I forgot another example came up in one of the two other sessions, and it was almost to this point, and, I, and I'm trying to remember the specific example, but, um, I think the person asked, like, well, what if we have a staff member who's just not like where we want to be? And I, I, I'm struggling to remember the specific example, but it seems to be along some of the same lines. Um, I, I think that I don't, I often don't have a magic silver bullet answer for a lot of this work. Even that silver bullet, nobody like to kill a werewolf, but um, you know, I don't have the magic answer all the time for this. I think it's a matter of how much are we willing to grapple with it? How much are we willing to engage? How much are we willing to say, maybe there's something that I'm doing that I could be doing differently, and I'm gonna engage with my team, and you know, again, without knowing you or the, the, the vibe or the culture you create on your team, I wouldn't know, but um, oftentimes I think there are things there, and it's just, we gotta be willing to grapple with it a little bit. Um, I think the specific examples you just gave I would say, I would ask you to try to eliminate those terms from your, you know, just so that. It's kind of easy, but I'm trying to get up against you a little bit. No, no, I, I, I appreciate it. I, you know, I, I love it when, I think that this, this is the other magic thing with diversity work, that this, this is the work. This is, this is the work. Coming together across some layer of difference with folks and having like meaningful conversations. And I think for some reason, just don't do it as much. And, and maybe the busyness of the work they hear, you know, like, you know, the priorities are the priorities, but this is part of the work. So I, I please bring a different idea, bring a counter idea, be, be the disruptor, you know, because I want to, I want to know what people are thinking and how we can kind of talk this out together. So again, without divulging the actual scenario, I think th there are certain um, behaviors that need to be displayed by team members, and if they're not, and you feel like something about their unique identity isn't just meeting up to the standard of what you would ask of all employees, then I think there is ways to continue to work with that person. Um, I hope that helped. Jason, I think, I think there's, uh, for me, to be able to do this work, you have to have a sense of curiosity, and then you've gotta be open to learning and growing, but also willing to make mistakes or ask difficult questions. Yes. So in, in all that, there's going to be folk who just don't want to do it. And right. they're not going to do it, no matter what you do with it. I don't want to say the wrong thing, so I'm not going to say anything yeah. at all. Right. Or they just think it's a bunch of fluff and, you know, you just... I'm unapologetic. <clears throat> right. I'm unapologetic. Yes. I, I, I guess it depends on what it is, because if it's like... You know, if somebody's displaying something in their workstation that's clearly offensive to half the floor, right. and it's causing a problem for everyone, and that person is just I'm being unapolog unapologetically me, 
I guess to a degree that statement can be accurate, but then it's our job as supervisors and others to like demonstrate to that person how and why that thing is offensive to everyone or half the people on the floor and what it's causing. And then hopefully, you know, reach that aha moment through that. Um, but some pancakes you're never gonna get to flip over. I don't, I don't like that, the terminology that's kind of, it's used a lot and it's like, oh, are you a good fit for an organization or team or that sort of thing? Because to me that says, well, then you know I can't be authentically who I am because you know somehow I don't fit into that that puzzle over there. But there there are going to be folks that just maybe this culture isn't right for them because they're refusing when we want to move forward with DEI, and maybe they need to be somewhere else. You know, and I, I know we've had a few situations where that has happened already. You know, and it's unfortunate, but I think that is part of the growth of DEI. I, I, when I'm talking to HR folks, I try to get them to embrace like value add versus good fit. Do you want this person to come in and fit in, or do you want them to add value to what you're doing? Um, I think if they're being interviewed, they're already on paper qualified for the job, or else you wouldn't have extended them the interview. So on paper, at least, they've met the minimum qualifications to be extended an interview. So now it's more, yeah. I, so I, I try to get HR folks to instead of a good fit is it going to be a value add um, and I you know are you going to bring that person in to tell them exactly everything to do or do you want them to add to the value of the team based on the unique you know talents that they bring yes when I think about it because I also frequently say that we're hurting cats when we're working with the students um, when I think about how to manage that in, in the context of if what you're doing and saying makes somebody else feel less than, then you need to not do it. So Asadala, who's our admin at the School of Nursing, he speaks six languages and only one of them is English. And the first time I said something about her to cats, he felt bad because he had no idea what the hell I was talking about. <laughs> so then if I'm making him feel bad, because that's one of my stock things that I have said a lot, then I'm the one that's got to figure that out. You know, I'm the one that's got to gotta figure that out for him. And so I, I, I have. I think you have to know your audience. I think you have to know, um, you have to you have to be aware of the power gradient that exists. It happens all the time with students because students have no power. If they have no power. And, and, you know, one of the things that happen is people will refer to the students as the kids. Like, we got some students that are 19, we got some students that are 45, and that should not for kids. And so you have to think about what you're saying, what you're doing, does it make somebody else feel less than? Whether that's on purpose or accidental. And then, and then you modify the way, the way that you sort it out. Like, Asana had to learn how the alphabet runs in English because it's Bible stuff. So, you know, that had to figure it out. That also is not. I feel like that's an easy thing to comprehend with leaders and people who have gone through communication training and this kind of training. But what I'm dealing with a staff, staff on staff, that does not, does, it does. Like, I am like a three headed alien. You know, I'm not even an individual anymore. You know, it just, and I'm saying you're affecting your co workers. And they, you know, they don't care. It's, it's not them. It's not how, you know, and I, want to resort to violence. <laughs> <laughs> There's a against that. I mean, I do find myself saying to, in a lot of situations, both with the students and, and, and with the staff, this is a cultural thing. You need to be respectful of this. This is a cultural norm for this other person. And, and, and that's how I think I have managed some of the unintentional stupidness that people say and do. And, you know, how can he even think like that? That's his culture. He gets to think like that. That's why we hired him. Um, and so it, those kinds of things have straightened out some of the misguided, you know, I didn't mean that, but it had to happen anyhow. I just want to say something like, do you want to also carry the profession to treat them like this? Like, you know, if I unintentionally hurt you, I'm sorry. Like, that's not my goal. That's not what I signed up to do. I signed up to make you better. 
12 hours or you know like this from third people so i guess i just sometimes i just don't again understand and want to use open finance mm -hmm. I, I do think that in a place of employment there is you know the, if the behavior is clearly you know impacting others uh you know if it's something that's warrantable you know creating a file you know i do think there are formal channels but um there are but there's always things that might come you know like yes. the union so sometimes you try to appeal to people and appeal to something that you know you know no higher value like, right that value is yeah. you know what i mean so to me the reason i became a nurse is i generally want to help people help right so you know if you're telling me oh courtney by dating the person with that silk you're actually hurting them i would be appalled and i would be very upset because they would never use that silk again you know again right right small example but that's what i'm saying so if i come to someone and say you're you know hurting your peers or you hurt somebody's feelings or you attack someone else's values and they say i don't care that's, you know what i mean that's 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 you need to back them up you know what i mean so i guess have you ever thought of creating a scenario where the people affected by the person's behavior speak to them directly? We can, and I'm happy to tell you, but this is a whole other no, conversation. I, yeah. but I was just trying to get your view on, get my mind thinking in other ways. You yes. know, when you bring other views that aren't necessarily, you know, you're not a nurse, you're not. So mm -hmm. to kind of get my juices in my head thinking and whatever, yes. you know. So, I do think I do think that we should take that default setting of if you're already at the table, you know, making a little bit more room at the table, trying to you know. But I also think that in a place of employment, there is, a, you know, a certain level of standard of, of professional behavior, professional operation that needs to be, you know, uh, uh, adhered to as well. And I guess it's your lucky role as managers to kind of figure out a way to navigate that. But I will say that as as these. Ellis Promise students come on, you know, just understand that, like, first of all, the intergenerational differences, but also the world that these young folks are brought up in is, is the exposure, you know, like, they're, they're looking for, you know, they, they can't imagine a world where they walk in a room and it's all of one race, right? Or they can, like, they're used to a very diverse world. So I think understanding the perspective of where these students are coming from is important as well. Um, but maybe in that situation, you know, I, again, uh, the, what do they call restorative, those restorative approaches where if somebody's been impacted negatively by someone else's behavior, um, having the people impacted speak directly to that person uh, sometimes, you know, is proven to go a longer way than any just purely punitive kind of measures. Um, I know we're over on time. Um, or, or, or near it, I just wanted to show this, you know, a reminder that um, that day to day when we're um, interacting with folks, what's above the waterline and what's primarily in awareness, what's easy to see is how people dress, the music they listen to, maybe the food they eat, but what more encompasses somebody and what more makes them who they are is what's below that waterline, what's more difficult to see, what takes work to get to know, the same holds true for organizations. You know, I come here four times in two weeks for some trainings and I get to see the dress code, the location, the people, the office environment, but what I don't know is, what is the work ethic? What are the core values? What's the results, the mission, the purpose of this organization? Um, and then, as I'm often talking to folks uh, in HR, you know, it's just a, a reminder during hiring scenarios that in an interview, what's a, at the top of the waterline is easy to see what's you know, harder to see is below that waterline. Um, if we had time, I would ask you all, and maybe this could be a parting thing as you leave, um, if we had time, I was gonna ask, after going through this presentation and maybe raising a little bit of awareness about microaggressions, I would ask, what is one thing you're gonna stop doing, one thing you'll start doing, one thing you'll continue doing after today's uh, uh, session? So maybe that's something for you all to think about um, as you leave. We're gonna stop. <laughs> and then again, well, I mean, we're not going to stop. We're going to figure out a way to do that. We're going to hurt ducks. Yeah, finally, right? I mean, where are you from? You ready? Oh, you're Hi there. Hi. Nice day, huh?
Where are you from? Your English is perfect. San Diego. We speak English there. <clears throat> Where are you from? Well, I was born in Orange County, but I never actually lived there. Uh, I mean before that. Before I was born. Yeah, like, well, where are your people from? Well, my great-grandma was from Seoul. Korean. I knew it. I was like, she's either Japanese or Korean. But I was leaning more towards Korean. Amazing. Yeah. I'm Shaheen. There's a really good teriyaki barbecue place in my apartment. So I actually really like kimchi. Cool. What about you? Where are you from? San Francisco. But where are you from? <laughs> really? You're Native American? No, uh, regular American. Oh, well, uh, I guess my grandparents are from England. Oh, well. Hey, <laughs> students share with me that has been said to them. Um, when we did that awareness campaign with the little black, you know, with the little dry erase points, I couldn't, I was baffled by some of the things that students had said to them. So that is me. Uh, that is my presentation. I have, I was able to find on inclusive language, I was able to find specific industry guidance specific to healthcare. This talks a little bit more about the patient provider relationship but I'll leave copies here if anybody does want to take one about the importance of inclusive language in patient provider relationships. And I think some of the ideals or ideas could be translated to colleague to colleague uh, relationship as well. So um, again, I'm Jason Benitez. If there's any questions or comments, uh, Father Tony knows how to get a hold of me. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.